Okay, so welcome everyone to the uh, Inca Quantum Annealing Network seminar for today, November 29th, and uh, very pleased to uh, uh, offer the seminar slot today to Emanuela de la Torre from Bar Elan University in Tel Aviv, who's going to be talking about uh, navigating the limits of quantum annealing. Over to you, Emanuela. Okay, uh, thanks, Paul. So thanks a lot for the for this uh, invitation. Um, I've uh, been following some of your presentations online, and it's uh, it's really nice. So I hope that this is you know maybe the beginning of of some new collaborations with this uh, team, which uh, I found very interesting topics. Um, okay, so you know. Uh, especially because this is a virtual seminar, so let me introduce. Uh, and I also heard this is the first. I mean, the first Israeli speaker. Speaker, so well, this is Israel. It's pretty small, you know, twenty miles wide or so. Uh, and we are physical, ge geographically located close to uh, Tel Aviv, and uh, the university, Barilan University, is one of the main public institutions, uh, public universities in Israel. Have a nice campus, and I hope you you will be. Uh, our guests at some point. So my group deals with the dynamics of quantum systems, of many body quantum systems. And naturally, uh, in the last few years, we have been uh, studying uh, these uh, quantum computers, superconducting circuits as a platform to uh, study many body, interesting many body physics. For this project, so the projects that I will uh, present today, uh, it will be a little bit broader than the, than the abstract. Uh, depending on the time we have, but I would like to uh, acknowledge my uh, former student Daniel Atzitz, uh, as well as the experimental group uh, led by Avi Peer, and uh, also uh, collaborations with the Rigetti team of uh, uh, Matthew Rigor, Maxim, and, and Bram, uh, and of course the, the funding agencies. So uh, I guess you know Ising and Ehlers do not need an introduction for, to this uh, uh, to this. Uh, audience, but nevertheless, you know, I guess I should have a slide about the fact that annealers, uh, uh, the idea is to take a simple state and adiabatically change some, some parameter so that the final state of the system is going to be a solution of an interesting problem. And in particular, we would like to be the solution of the Ising model, so the ground state of the Ising model. Um, how does that work? So there are many physical, so that's sort of the theory idea, the physical implementations, there are many types of annealers. Uh, there are physical annealers. So if you take some material and you warm it up to very high temperatures and then you cool it down slowly, then in some cases that could, for instance, become a ferromagnet. So that could be uh, the solution of the uniform ferromagnetic ising uh, Hamiltonian. So that would be an example of, uh, of, of, an, of an annealer. Um, then, of course, one could do a simulated annealing. So, you know, simulate this process of, on, a, on a quantum computer, sorry, on a classical computer. And, um, and of course, then there are quantum computers like the quantum computer by D-Wave, uh, which is called the quantum annealing. And in that case, the annealing process is led by the adiabatic switching on or switching off of some uh, RF fields. So there is uh, some superconducting circuit to which you apply some pulses, some RF fields that are adiabatically, whose intensity is adiabatically changed. And then there is the uh, you know, fourth type of, of annealer, uh, which is the so-called coherent Ising machines. In which is an optic system. So it's a tabletop experiment in which the, the adiabatic parameter that you are changing is the intensity of a laser. So that you are you know, slowly uh, cranking, you know, uh, turning on the, the intensity of the laser. And then again, you hope that the final state of the system will be the solution to some interesting problem. So the question is, uh, is it, I mean, is it practice? Do you do really people use it? And uh, well, it turns out that that depends on the type of annealers. So for the physical annealer and stimulating annealing, then of course, yes, people do use it all the time, even for industrial purposes, simulating annealing has been used to solve, uh, you know, interesting real life problems. While quantum annealers and coherentizing machines, in spite of all the publicity, they are for the moment, uh, still at the demonstration level. So there is no real classical application, still have real application that has been uh, demonstrated until this point, something that could not have been done by simulated Um So the question is why, and what I would like to discuss today is our attempt to address this question, where the idea is that, okay, we are somehow trapped in this uh, Mediterranean Sea, and the way out could be to explore the limits. So by exploring the limits of quantum annealing, we hope to find a way out of the, of the Mediterranean Sea towards you know, uh, a new world 
uh, as you can see. Well, it, it, here England is not even yet to be discovered uh, by Europe by you know, this, uh, by, the, by the Greeks. Um, so, so that's the idea. So, so I think that you know exploring the limits of quantum learning is important towards trying to extend those those systems. Uh, to real life applications. And what I would like to tell you today is basically, in, in short, three different stories uh, that deal one with quantum annealing and one with coherent energy machines. And the first story is an attempt to make you know, a company out of it. So I will briefly tell you about the startup that we are trying to establish um, in the attempt to use annealers for, for real life problems. Okay. Uh, by the way, feel free to stop you at any time if there are questions. I guess this is uh, for the moment very trivial, so there is no question. But in the in the in the in the in the incoming in the incoming slides, if you have questions, please please go ahead. So quantum annealing. Quantum annealing is based on the idea of a diabatic theorem, which is a property of quantum systems, in which if you, for instance, uh, start the system in the ground state of some Hamiltonian and then adiabatically change that Hamiltonian, you will end up in the ground state of the final Hamiltonian. So an example could be a ferromagnetic Ising model in which uh, you start you know, with lambda equals to zero. So you have only the paramagnetic Hamiltonian whose ground state is very easy to, com to compute. And then the final state, uh, it would be the ferromagnet. So well, in this case, also the final state is very easy to compute. So we are also we are solving a trivial problem. But again, in the idea of exploring the limits of what an annealer can do, I think it is fine also to solve trivial problem, so solve trivial problems so that you can check, you know, whether the solution is a good solution or not. Uh, the problem with this model, actually, like any interesting model is that there is a phase transition. So you really cannot follow adiabatically from the paramagnet to the ferromagnet. And that's because of the closing of an energy gap uh, at the phase transition. So that means that there is no, due to the gap closing, there is no more ex an exponential suppression of, of errors. So the question is, you know, how many errors you are creating, which in this case are defects, right? So a perfect ferromagnet would be that all the spin point in the same direction, either all up or all down. And the defects are, and the defects are basically domain walls. So something that where the ferromagnetic order is, is broken. And um, in, in, if you could follow the system adiabatically, then the number of defects would be exponentially small. But because, and that indeed, but and that indeed works as long as you don't uh, catch a phase transition. If you don't, you, you try to cross a phase transition because at that point there is no more exponential suppression. Nevertheless. Still, there is suppression. I mean, still, if you go slowly, there will be very few uh, defects. And this was stated by Kibel Zurich, which found that, that there is there is, should be a power law relation. So instead of an exponential suppression, there is a power law suppression, which is still a suppression um, uh, between the number of defects and this tau. Tau is the, the time you know that it takes you to go from one side to the other. So of course, the smaller tau is. Uh, sorry, the larger tau is, the, the less, the fewer defects you have, and the relation is, is a power law. Uh, and, you know, there is an interesting relation between this power law and uh, this uh, square root uh, uh, advantage of the, of the um, Grover algorithm in quantum search. So this, this power law, you know, relates to, to algorithms that are used in, in quantum computers, and really there is a relation between adiabatic quantum computing and universal gate-based quantum computers. That's not what we want to discuss here. Um, what we would like to do is to realize really this protocol. So the adiabatic, the adiabatic switching on of the ferromagnetic coupling in a gate-based quantum computer. So what is the challenge? The challenge is that you don't know how to realize this Hamiltonian. So this very nice Hamiltonian that you can create, you know, in a real ferromagnet, you, you don't know how to create it in gates. What you can do with gates, you can create, you know, either the paramagnetic part or the ferromagnetic part. And what we do is to basically uh, you know, alternate between the ferromagnetic and the paramagnetic coupling. So ideally, we would like to have both of them at the same time that would give you the ferromagnetic Hamiltonian. In reality, what we do it, we do it in, in, uh, in a discrete way. So that's one important difference with respect to the story that you have heard about Kibel Zurich in the D wave, uh, uh, from D wave in which they can really flow adiabatically. Here, what we do, we need to alternate between these two types of Hamiltonian, which if you want is basically a throttle expansion of, of, the, of the continuous time uh, algorithm. So first of all, let's stop for a moment to discuss this model itself. So let's assume that we stick at the given lambda. So we have a given alternation of paramagnet and ferromagnet. And that depending on the ratio between these two parameters uh, gives rise to 
eh, e, e tue, tue ne Meltonian, uh, tue periodic Meltonian, so tue Floquet problem. And this problem has been studied uh, actually for a very long time, but recently, well, in 2016, it became very popular because this model of artillating ferromagnet and paramagnet, ferromagnet and paramagnet give rise to time crystals. So, you know, this famous, you know, then it was realized on a quantum computer. Okay, then Google has seen a new phase of matter time crystals. There are also floquet topological. We also have a work on floquet topological using the same scheme. Again, that's not what we want to discuss here. We are going to follow the simplest path. As I told you, you know, we are trying to take the simplest possible uh, problem, which is going to the, from the paramagnet to the ferromagnet. And these blue dots that you see here, these blue squares, the idea is that you are doing it in a stepwise. So instead of doing it continuously, you go in stepwise. Um, then, well, so, so I also want to mention that there are these red dots. So the red dots are an idea of, instead of going step by step to go, to use this as variational parameters. So, you know, take this phase diagram and try to move variationally. So let, let, let's assume I give you nine steps and I want to minimize the number of defects. So, okay, one way is to follow these blue lines. That's sort of the, Kibel Zurich way, but you could also say, what if I just go variationally? I choose these the nine points as, as variational parameters and I optimize them so that I will get closest possible to the solution. And that's essentially the idea of the QAOA. Um, of the QA. So in a sense, the QAOA protocol is always better than the Abatic protocol, just because you use these points as variational parameters. So you know you can you always improve, right? That is always a, a positive gradient. You either it's either the same, you know, it's either that you really choose the adiabatic solution as the best solution, or you can find maybe a smarter, uh, better solution. And that's that's the that's the idea of QA. Um, so one point which is very important is that there is actually a theorem uh, that cable Zurich. Uh, so the Kibble zero theory would uh, is valid also for Froclet systems. And that's something that we have shown in 2015 together with Angelo Rosomano. Uh, I would say that at least is correct for integrable systems. And indeed the model we are considering this IDIM model is a, a coherent system, is an integrable system. And in that case, one can still apply the Kibble zero scaling. Um, if the system is non-integrable, then, um, because you have a periodic drive, this gives rise to heating. And so you need to worry that in addition to following the ground state, maybe you are heating the system. Uh, so, you know, non-integrable systems are a different story. Nevertheless, as I'm going to show you in a moment, you know, you can use the integrable system as a good approximation of, of a non-integrable one, at least in some, in some limits. Okay, so having said that, the, you know, let me show you some first numerical results. So again, what we do, we start with the paramagnet, we go into the ferromagnet and we do it in some number of steps. So I call N the number of steps. So here there are say nine steps and then I can study how many defects I'm creating as a function of the number of steps. And the Kibel Zurich scaling will tell you that the number of defects should show should uh, go down as N to the power 0 0.5. So one over N to the power 0 0.5, this is the same square root that I was telling you before in the, in the Kibel Zurich scaling. So, and this is shown here numerically again, you see that for large N, you nicely reproduce this dashed line. So the dashed line is the, the scaling, the expected scaling, and these uh, points, you know, this, this black curve is, um, is what you see numerically. And again, the numerics can be done for really large systems because the system is integrable. So for this specific model, one can give, you know, one can study system sizes of hundreds or more spins. Um, okay, good. So that's uh, that's sort of known. The question that we wanted to ask is what happens in a real quantum computer? So of course the real quantum computer has noise and therefore it's important to study what happens if you have some time dependent noise and even which in our case is not only time dependent but is also spatially dependent. So we assume that each qubit instead of experiencing the ferromagnet, the paramagnetic uh, field that is supposed to follow uh, is it will be rather following some random uh, some random magnetic field that varies for each qubit, and this random magnetic field is given by some sigma noise. So sigma noise is the intensity of the random magnetic field. So if sigma is zero, then you go back to the previous Kibel Zuri scale. And then, uh, so I would like to point out that Adolfo and, and collaborators, they have studied the same problem, but in the case, first of all, in the continuous time case, and also in the case that the 
magnetic field was a constant magnetic field over all the spins. So it's very much related to what they have done, although there are still differences. So what is the intuition? The intuition is that, uh, in principle, you would like to go as slow as possible so that you get very few defects. But if you have noise, the more you wait, the more noise you will experience. And so you, then you are, you are uh, so there is, you know, a, 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 a interplay between the Kibel Zurich, which is telling you that the slower you go, the less defects you have, and the noise that goes the other way around. Actually, Adolfo called it the anti kibel Zurich. So the interplay between these two, uh, these two, um, um, these two effects is going to give us a non-monotonous behavior. And the way to study this non-monotonous behavior, that can be done you know, schematically by assuming that the, the number of defects is at the sum of these two terms. So that's a sort of a phenomenological ansatz that the total number of defects is at the sum of a kibel Zurich term that goes down and the noise term that goes up. And the noise term is going to be uh, proportional to the, to, the, to the intensity of the noise that you apply. And so, and indeed that works very nicely. So what you see here in col the colored curves are again, the numerics for this model. Again, the model is still inter integrable because it still can be mapped to free fermions. So you can still solve it for very large systems and very long times um, by basically multiplying some, some large matrices. And uh, you see that these dashed, the black dashed curves are uh, just the expectation of taking the Gibbons Zurich scaling and adding some sigma noise, some just sigma times noise times a constant. So that means that uh, you know that that, that 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 approach works very nicely. What is now nice about this this very simple formula is that, as, as was also shown here in this paper, is that you can you take you if you want to ask what is the optimal number of steps so that you will get the least number of defects, uh, and uh, uh, there is a very simple formula that relates the optimal number of steps, which is here this this optimum, you know, the the an optimal uh, as a function of the of the of the strength of the noise, and uh, which is this minus four over three, and indeed that works very nicely with the, with the numerics. Um, so that's important because as I told you, this uh, uh, adiabatic protocol that we are studying is if you want the simplest case of a QAOA protocol. And a big question that QAOA people are asking themselves is how many steps should I put? You know, uh, um, how, what is the optimal number of layers that I should try to simulate uh, before I start my variational principle. And this is a, a simple expression that one can use to gauge uh, what is going to be uh, the number of steps. So of course, the fewer noise, you, the, the, the smaller the noise is, the more steps it's better to, to, to plug in. Uh, but there is an optimal number of steps. Um, so I, I told, as I told you, this is valid for an integrable model. Uh, and the question is, well, is it going to be still valid in a quantum computer, which is doesn't have that particular type of noise? So the reason we chose this specific type of noise, because that's basically the only thing you can do while keeping the, 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 the Ising model integrable. Oh, you can also plug in some noise here, but I mean, there are only two options and they're actually equivalent. So- uh, yeah, Emanuele, is, Emanuele yeah. can I just ask, ask a quick question about your noise then? So, so I'm tr having difficulty understanding what the, what the spectrum of this noise looks like uh, is it you know so it's white noise it's white noise okay. white noise yes you can see here sorry the notation so i is the spin and n is the time step and so it's a delta function of the time step so this is a discrete noise right because at each step we will have some noise and that's uh, it's going to just be a white noise on, on the step level so for each step we have uh, some noise so, so if you increase the number of steps, is that that's the equivalent of increasing the the the, the bandwidth of the noise? Have, have I got that right, or maybe not? Um, no. So, so I think that we need to go back to this picture. So you see yeah. here that there is one variable that I didn't touch. I put it to one, which is the radius of this uh, of this uh, circle here, and the radius of this circle is related to the frequency of the drive. Um, so the bandwidth that you are speaking about is, is somehow related to the time step of, to the typical, to the length of the time step. And the length of the time step is determined by this radius. Uh -huh. So increase, so the increasing the bandwidth is actually going to a smaller radius and going to a smaller radius is basically bringing you back to the throttle limit. So the throttle limit is really a limit in which you take this radius to zero. Uh -huh. Then you recover just the product, and then you know, and then you go back to continuous time, and then oh, your okay. bandwidth is going to be infinite. 
Um, so if you want, this is a different a different parameter, um, I would say. Okay, okay, I see. Yeah, it's, it's, but at the moment it's white noise at least. I understand. Good. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks. 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 That's, that's an important point. So, I mean, of course, then one may ask, but, but you know, my, one may ask whether there are also correlated colored noise, what, what is going to be. Uh, this is, so uh, let me show you two simulations that we have performed. Uh, these are simulations of small systems up to six qubits. What I would like to highlight is this no monotonous behavior. And the two models that we have considered are realistic models for noise in, in a quantum computer. One of them is assuming that every time that you apply a two qubit gate, there is going to be some noise that is described by some stochastic Pauli matrices. So you apply your gate, and then after that, you apply some, 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 some randomly, you randomly apply some, some Pauli gates, and the intensity of these Pauli gates can be gauged or, or calibrated from the hardware. So we take the realistic numbers from the hardware. This is a collaboration with Rigetti, so this is specifically Aspen 11. You take those numbers from Aspen 11, and then you can you know how many of these random Paulis you need to uh, you need to um, you need to apply after each each two qubit gain. That's one model. The other model that's red. The blue model is is if you want a simpler model in which you assume that the gates are perfect, but while you apply the gates, your qubits are decaying and they are decaying and defacing according to a T1 T2. So you take the T1 T2 of um, uh, of 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 that are gate you know known for the quantum computer for the specific qubits that I'm going to use in my experiment. And then you apply them. As you can see, the, the blue is more optimistic, right? Because it's assuming that you have only single qubit defects. In reality, also the gates are imperfect. So uh, the, the red one is, is a little bit worse. The blue is, 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 is better. You see the number of defects in the blue is smaller. And you know, as, as you can probably already see from this uh, picture, uh, the, the, exper the experiment is somewhere in between. So it's uh, it's uh, better than the it's better than the, this stochastic Pauli noise, but it's a little bit worse than the, than the Aspen. Actually, in fact, the optimal number uh, of, of defects is actually larger than you what you would expect from the from the simulated uh, models. So um, I think this is also this is telling us I think two two things. First of all, that um, the behave the non monotonic behavior is universal. And second, that it's important to have good noise models. And this T1, both the T1, T2, and the stochastic Pauli are qualitatively good models, but they are not quantitatively good in the sense they do not capture the correct behavior of the hardware. So they can give you some, uh, you know, some some guidelines, but not they do not have predictive power. And you know, so that's why it was very important for us to really test it on a specific algorithm that we know exactly what we are doing, so that we can check whether the results are the same uh, or not. I mean. Um, for a specific variable here, the defects, but I think this defects is telling you something about how the protocol is, is working. Um, so here I would like to highlight that the, the same experiment was performed around the same time in D, by D-Wave. As I mentioned, this is a continuous time experiment uh, and you see the same non-monotonous behavior. We have one important difference that, so here there are two experiments. One is for, large, for small J, which means high temperatures. And, and one is for small J, which means low temperatures. And as you can see, in the high temperature regime, it follows what we expect. And I think this is reasonable because the model that we have is basically an infinite temperature model, right? Especially the red one. The red one is just a random Pauli metric, so it's really like an infinite, uh, an infinite uh, temperature model, while uh, the, the low temperature limit is showing a little bit of a different behavior because at the end of the story, the defects will go to zero. And you can also already start seeing that here in the blue curve, you would need to run it long for longer. But if you run it for longer, you will see that also this goes down. So uh, and the reason is also well understood is that uh, because of the decay of the qubits, eventually you will find yourself, yourself in the zero, zero, zero state. So if you go really, really, really slowly, you will find in a no defect state that you, you can exactly solve the problem, but you, you have exactly solved the problem, not because of the, of, the, of the coupling, but because the system is decaying. So this is, this is telling you that, um, that, 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 that you, know, you need to be careful about the type of noise that you have. And uh, the, 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 the noise, when it is at low temperature, it can also lead to a decay of the number of defects. So that's, uh, that's by itself, I think. Uh, interesting and, and questions that we are currently trying to understand is whether one could think of this process as sort of a thermalization with above. 
So here there is no really, I mean, the model we have, there is no buff, there is some noise, but this noise can be considered maybe as, as, as a thermal buff. So there is this competition between the unitary uh, Kibble-Zurich dynamic and uh, these, these uh, heat with this temperature uh, suppression. And you can see that, you know, in, it's interesting because both processes lead to a decrease in the number of, in the, they decay in the number of, of defects, but the, this goes in a no monotonous behavior. So it goes down a little bit up and then gone down again. So two processes that both reduce the number of defects because they're different process. One is the unit and one is dissipative. Eventually, you know, build up an interesting intermediate dynamics. Um, okay, so, Paul, in principle, gave me 30 minutes, uh, and I see that I already spent 25 of, of my time. So, Paul, uh, guide me how much uh, how much time I... But I also noticed that previous speakers also stole a little bit more time. <laughs> well, so I mean, I think... How much time I have, I will. I promise I will, have, I will stay on time exactly. I mean, I think this, the standard of sharing, particularly today, is, is, is very relaxed. So uh, maybe 10, 15 minutes, I'm very happy to... Uh, okay, continue. 15 minutes. Okay, great. So 7.45... You can have, you know, uh, you you uh, uh, you can already uh, warm up your 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 water for for your pasta. Uh, Excellent. You, you, oh oh, buttata, butta la pasta. Okay, it's it's time to. <laughs> so we will have dinner at, in 15 minutes. Good. So coherent dynamics machines. Let me go quickly, but I think it's interesting because actually in this, you know, maybe this audience is less uh, familiar with this topic. So. Par parametric, it's the coherent dynamics machines are basic, based on the idea of a parametric oscillator. So this is in a PowerPoint how a parametric oscillator looks like to take your oscillator and you uh, agitate it vertically. So what will happen is that if you agitate it slow enough, if you touch it fast, nothing happens. But if you agitate it slow, then uh, this is going to be a parametric amplifier. And so any initial fluctuations you may have in your pendulum will be exponentially enhanced. And at the end of the story, you will find your pendulum that goes up and down following your hand. But it follows your hand in a particular way, which is that if this is the pump, actually the pendulum is going to follow your hand at the half the frequency. So this is also known as time doubling, uh, which means that the response of the system is exactly one half of the period of the, of the drive. And uh, if that also means that in fact, there are two possible solutions. So if you want, you can be either in phase with the even strokes or with the odd strokes. That's, these are the two, the two options. And uh, having two solutions, you can first of all, think of it as a discrete time crystal. So there is an infinite discussion now, is a parametric oscillator a time crystal or not? Uh, then of course, I mean, uh, they, they want to say, no, it's not, but the other says, okay, don't want to enter into this, uh, this battlefield. But I do want to say that for us, uh, having two solutions, you can think of it as a bit. So a single parametric oscillator is like having a bit with two possible solutions. And that's what's the idea that was pushed forward uh, 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 in the coherent lines and machine. So before going into many parametric oscillators, let me discuss the two parametric oscillators. That's a work that we've done with the experimental group at Barilan by Avi Per, Leon Bell, and Marcello Calvanesi Strinati. They just coupled two RF parametric oscillators. It turns out that the phase diagram, the dynamical phase diagram is quite interesting because of course you can have you know, four solutions right, uh, like two times two, but you can also have uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, also these oscillating behaviors, these limit cycles. And the reason for that is that you can actually couple the parametric oscillator in two ways, either in uh, a, a real way, so by conserving the total energy, so just transferring the energy from one oscillator to the other, or in a dissipative manner. So coupling the dissipative, the dissipative time so that they will sort of try to, uh, to be in phase, you know, that, that, so that, that when they are in phase, when they are, say, out of phase, you will dissipate some energy so that they will tend uh, towards. Uh, and then this interplay between real and imaginary can give rise to interesting physics. So say that I don't have time to discuss the whole paper, but that's the, the upshot that I would like to, uh, to discuss. Uh, OK, good. Uh, so coherent is machines. So this was pushed forward by, by, by Yamamoto and collaborators. You can see here a review article. And the idea was to really engineer the, the Ising model in the dissipative coupling of many coupled parametric oscillators. Um, so how the, that works? So what, what you do, you basically start your parametric oscillators without any pump and you adiabatically turn on the pump. And then 
naively you would say, oh, well, I know this is like a laser. So there is mode competition and there is one mode that is going to win. So you can think of these, these Ising variables as some you know, continuous variables. And then you can think of it as a matrix and you diagonalize the matrix. You take the largest eigenvalue. This is the mode which is uh, more enhanced by the pump or if you want less dissipated. And this is going to be one that, that will win the war among all the, all, all the modes. And this is going to give the solution to the Ising problem. The point is that this is, cannot be the case. And the reason is this, that you know that solving an Ising model is an empty heart problem. You know, there are two to the end solutions. While finding the, the say the, low, the, the maximal eigenvalue of a matrix, that's not an empty heart problem. This is a, a polynomial problem. So clearly it cannot be that by mode competition, you can win an Ising model, okay? And that's something that we have demonstrated here uh, in this paper. Okay, the reference is going to come in a moment. We have just tested that. So we take a random Ising model and we test whether the winning mode, this uh, you know, most uh, the, the mode comp the winning mode is going to be the one that solves the, the Ising model. And this, the, the answer is well, for small variables, maybe yes, we are sometimes lucky, but if you have many, you take many variables, then you see that the fastest growing mode is actually not the solution to the Ising problem. So, in a sense, if you just consider linearized. Uh, you know, linearized equations for the coherent Ising machines, you are not solving uh, the Ising problem. However, what we have shown is that interestingly enough, if you do restore the nonlinearities, so if you take into account that actually the parametric oscillator is not just the instability, the instability is the beginning of the dynamics, but then there are the nonlinear terms. You know, the limit cycles I told you before, they do not come because of the, of the of, you know, it's not only a matter of instability, it's a matter of how the nonlinearities will then shape your dynamics. And it turns out that why, by introducing the right amount of, of nonlinearities, then you can actually restore uh, the solution to the Ising problem. Uh, so, of course, not always, as you can see here, you know, it doesn't work always, but you can enhance significantly the probability of finding the right solution when you take your coherent Ising machine in the nonlinear mode, and then it's solving some very complex, you know, nonlinear dynamical equations. Uh, which are very hard to solve. And, uh, and well, then uh, maybe they are, at least in some cases, we see that they are solving the Eisen problem. So it's uh, the coherentizing machine taking the right amount of nonlinearities is extremely important. Uh, okay, good. So I, I see I'm even uh, now ahead of time with respect to Paul's limits, uh, which is great. So I have now one slide which is telling you about. Um, you know, quantize. So quantize is a company that we are trying to establish. Uh, and um, for it, it has been funded recently, you know, this year, we are seven experts uh, coming from both, you know, quantum stuff, this is my experience, and real life problems, you know, in the, in the real industry guys. Uh, and the idea is to use a quantum annealers to solve real life problem and hopefully bring a, uh, you know, 100x optimization, uh, uh, in, in enhancing of the optimization capabilities using quantum computers, and in particular, I would say quantum annealers. So uh, as you all know, there is a lot of investments that has been put on in, uh, in, in quantum computers and these investments are expected to grow, but people do expect you know, something back. So uh, if, uh, in, if people in the industry will invest $6 billion uh, in, 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 in quantum computing in, in a couple of years, then they will, they will expect that the quantum computers are able to do something useful. Uh, and that's exactly what we are trying to do. So we are trying to focus on those problems, the real, real life problems that map the best to the Ising model. Because eventually, you know, the quantum annealers is solving an Ising model, which is for physicists, great. You go, wow, I'm solving an Ising model. But, you know, you cannot, you, this is not, you know, uh, you, need to, you need to find uh, Ising, you know, problems in real life that can be mapped uh, in an efficient way to, and I stress the efficient part, because you can map, you know, the Ising model is NP complete. So you can map any problem to the Ising problem. But, uh, but, but the question is, you know, is it efficient? So you need to find problems that they can be efficiently mapped. That's, that's the key of what we are doing. And we claim that we have some, uh, some, some, some very nice results, which are still, you know, IP, uh, IP protected. So I can, you know, I'm showing you just some graph without really giving the details of, of what exactly we are doing. Uh, but I think that, uh, yes, by, by implementing the right, like, first of all, choosing the right type of problem. Uh, when I speak to investors, the first time I told them, you know, I think there is maybe 1% of the problems in the world that can be solved by quantum annealers. 
Okay, then I was said I said okay maybe you shouldn't say that this way but this is really what I think you know uh, there there are very few problems that can be solved by real by near term quantum computers of course you know maybe in the long term you will have million of qubits it's a different story but if we focus on the near term so say the cup next couple of years there are just maybe a few real life problems that can be solved and it is important I think. Uh, to find, if you just randomly pick up a, a, a problem and try to solve it in the quantum areas, you're probably going to fail. By the way, this is what we see in the in the in the amount, you know uh, uh, in, in in happening you know everywhere in the all the corporates and startups. So we say, well, you first need to focus on the right problem, and then you try to implement it, and then you can get maybe some some advantage. So that's uh, that's the challenge. So I would like to thank you for for your attention. Um, I have discussed uh, three different attempts. Uh, to explore the limits of quantum annealers. Uh, I cannot claim that we know yet how to, uh, you know, cross uh, to ex go out of the Mediterranean Sea and find, uh, find England or, or the US. Uh, but uh, I think that, you know, what we, we have done so far uh, is, is, is useful to uh, at least exclude some possible uh, directions and, and try to, uh, to find uh, new, new ones. So, yeah. Thank you. Good, thank you very much, Emanuele. I'll uh, instigate a round of applause on, on everyone's behalf. Um, good, and open up uh, for any questions if you're happy to take questions, Emanuele. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. There's a few hardcore people still on the call. Uh, one less now. <laughs> so, um, well, maybe I'll uh, uh, kick off with a question then, um, which I fear is an experimental question. So I'm an experimentalist, so I'm allowed to ask experimental questions. Could you go back to your Rigetti data? Yep. You were doing the trotterization, which is interesting to see. This yeah, is yeah, yeah. So, 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 so presumably the, the total duration of your um, N stage um, gate-based quantum computation is constant here, or is, is the total duration in real-time units not constant? It's not constant. I mean, basically, the application of each gate is essentially uh, is essentially the same. So, um, you know, the, the, okay. the, the total time of the experiment is roughly proportional to n. Understood. So can, can you give us some indication, uh, again, experimentally of how yeah so so you t1 see that this... and t2 how the values of t1 and t2 fit yeah, on so, this so, so the, the, let me give you some numbers so applying yeah. uh applying a, a single two qubit gate requires approximately uh 200 uh, uh, nanoseconds and um so you know if you want to apply say now this is for a single two qubit gates now you need to take into account that i like i was plotting here you need at least to apply uh, first even, you know, even and not bonds separately. So we have tested that mm -hmm. what happens, at the, you can either, you know, go on each bond separately, then you will need six two qubit states for each step of my protocol, or uh, you could do it even and odd. So that means that for each step, I need a, 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 at least about uh, 400 uh, nanosecond, nanoseconds. And now, um, so if I take, um, you know, the, if I take say 10 steps, then, uh, okay, 10 steps, this is already four microseconds. And um, four microseconds is really at the borderline of T1 and T2. In principle, if you go to the calibration data of this, uh, this is done on Aspen 11, they now have a better quantum computer, the Aspen M2. But if you go to Aspen 11, you will see that the average T1, T2 is, uh, say about 10 microsecond, uh, but you need, or maybe, you know, a little bit more, but you need to, to, to remember that this uh, T1 and T2 are, are, are uh, calibrated when you, um, when you leave your system off and turn on just a single qubit. But because of cross -off, cross, cross, you know, crosstalk effects, uh, this T1 and T2 will be reduced when you actually use all the qubits together. Yeah. So that brings you towards, you know, from maybe the 10 to the five, uh, to the five microseconds. And that basically explains why already applying 10, uh, you know, 10, 10 steps is already uh, uh, of the order of your, of your T2. So T2 here is the, is the, is the, is the most significant problem. Yeah, okay. Um, so that's, the, these are roughly speaking the numbers. So that would mean, yeah. 
So you can sort of guess how many, you know, what this sort of optimal uh, number of layers, you can roughly uh, estimate it by just uh, computing the total time that, you, that your protocol will require and demanding it to be of the order of your T2, sort of the, the, the new T2, sort of the working T2, which is lower than the, than the, than the uh, sort of ideal T2. And I guess my, my other experimentalist question is uh, if you reveal the Andrew King data that is next to this, I guess. Yeah. So, so I guess the, 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 the absolute numbers of the kink densities are quite a bit lower on the right hand side. Uh, yeah. what, what do I read into this? Is that significant or is I think it, is so. it a universal? We shouldn't worry about it. Um, well, I mean, you, you see that also the, the, well, the time, okay, I don't know um, here. So, so you need to trans, this is a discrete process. This is a continuous time process. Yeah. So I don't know, uh, you know, you need to, to think about how to map the two. I, but I do agree with you that at the end of the story, there is a parameter that is uh, sort of time independent, which is the, val the optimal value of the number of defects. So uh, I think this is, uh, this is meaningful. I mean, asking yourself, what is the lowest number of defects? This is, I think, telling you something about uh, sort of the fidelities of your gates or your, how well the quantum computer is working as a quantum annealer. And I would say that, yes, the D-Ways is working much better than the gate-based quantum computer as an annealer. As you can see here, uh, so this is the anti-ferromagnetic case, the ferromagnetic case, the ferromagnetic case, which is the corresponded to ours, uh, the, the lowest number of defects, you know, be before you, you then die, you know, because yeah, yeah, of, sure. uh, it's, it's on the order of 10 to the two, maybe two, two times, uh, ten, sorry, 10 to the minus two, uh, which is significantly lower than we get here, which is, you know, 0 0.3. So there is an order of magnitude difference in how well the quantum annealer by D wave works for this specific problem with respect to the to the Rigetti. Then, of course, you may say, well, who cares? I mean, the Rigetti is not meant to be a quantum annealer. It's meant to be a universal gate-based quantum computer. But I think this is an important information. And, you know, I haven't shown it here, uh, but we also did test uh, this uh, same algorithm in a quantum computer with different technology that has is known to have a lower error ratio. And indeed, that, that went down. Still, it was much higher than, than, than the D-Wave, but it was significantly lower than uh, than than, uh, than than the Rigetti. So so I think this minimum, you know, this sort of uh, absolute value is telling you something. Uh, yeah. It's sort of if you want like a benchmark of your quantum computer for of a quantum optimization algorithm run on the quantum computer, uh, and it's giving you a number which I think is valuable to compare uh, different quantum computers. And uh, indeed, when we take different quantum computers with different error rates. Uh, yes, the, this number uh, corresponds to, to what you would do by... by. The, the nice thing here is that you are like getting a, 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 a single number for the entire quantum computer. So it is like teaching you, it's like a global, you know, benchmark for, for the entire computer, rather than, you know, asking yourself, oh, this gate, how good is this gate? You know, a specific gate, this is sort of a global parameter that is, again, global versus the number of qubits. So something also that we are trying to understand is what if I take more qubits? Will it? Uh, uh, so in principle, you know, you could say, what if I take the entire QPU uh, as my as my uh, as my benchmark? Uh, does it also go down? I mean, it, uh, at the beginning, you know, when we first ran it, we were happy. Okay, yeah, it goes down. At least that's something. You know, there is a signal. It's not trivial. I would like. To, I do want to say something. You know, you may look at this. Ah, oh, it's very boring. But in fact, we are we are running. You know, a depth five circuit uh, with six qubits which is, you know, uh, actually at the boundaries of what current, you know, quantum volume can do. So it, it's already a non-trivial calculation. So the fact that there was something that like, was, you know, we were already happy about that. Uh, okay, are there any other questions for Emanuele before we go to our pesta? Uh, if not, uh, let's uh, thank Emanuele once again. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation. Uh, next presentation will be... Uh, uh, a week from today, I guess, at the time that's good for Americans and Japanese people. And that is going to be with uh, David Ferguson. So thank you, Manayali, once again. And I shall now stop the recording. Thanks, Paul. Bye-bye.